Dingo, um, it's so great to have you on the podcast. Your life in fishing is enormous. Uh, you're an Aussie. You fished, you know, on the Great Barrier Reef. You grew up on a sailboat. Your dad was a fisherman, ran liveaboards, fished Hawaii, fished all over the world. You fished with uh, Dean Butler and Tom Evans, the greatest saltwater f- billfish team ever assembled for, uh, on fly. How did you end up in Jupiter? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you're an Aussie. You fish for a thousand pound fish. Why Jupiter? Uh, woman. <laughs> <laughs> they bring the best of men to their knees, don't they? <laughs> My wife, yeah. She's uh, from Fl- Fl- from Florida. Fort Lauderdale is where she was born. And, uh, you know, fishing is what led me to to meet my wife and uh was she a fisherman how'd you meet her no not at all um so other members of the family i guess like second cousins to her um her father's cousin avid bill fishermen they travel all over the world chasing billfish and that's how my wife's second cousin lisa met her husband bo jennings and was marlin fishing and at their wedding in Kauai. I was, it was a busy year for me. Um, I just bought my first house in Australia. I've been fishing Papua New Guinea, Brazil, Hawaii, Australia. It was a lot of traveling. I hadn't even, I owned the house for four months. I hadn't even slept in it yet. Wow. I just got back into Australia and the brother of the bride, uh, John Anderson, calls me up. He's like, Dingo, you're going to be at the wedding. I'm like, mate, I, you know, I just bought this house and just got back and, and I want to be there so badly, but... I don't know if I have the money and, and the time to be able to, to pull this off. He goes, can you get to Sydney? Yeah, I could get to Sydney. He goes, well, don't worry about it. The rest is taken care of. We'll get you the flights and we'll get you a place to stay in Hawaii, but you have to be there. And I'm like, okay, all right. So the cheapest plane ticket he could get me from Sydney to Hawaii was over to, I think, LA and then back. So I had to fly three oh. times the distance. And you rode in the baggage claim. Yeah, basically. Bag- baggage yeah, storage. That's right. <laughs> and I'm flying across the Pacific Ocean. I'm looking down. There's Hawaii right there. <laughs> I've got to go all the way over here and then back again. And it was a big wedding. There was a lot of Aussies that were there. There was a lot of people from it. was a huge wedding, multiple day event. The first event out in this beautiful lawn. And I checked in and John Anderson, he goes, see that girl over there? You need to meet her. And it was his second cousin, um, Beth, who's now my wife. And we hit it off. We hit it off big time. And uh, six month, six weeks later, we were engaged. Six weeks. Yeah. yeah. And uh, the next year, we got married in Kona, Hawaii. That's awesome. What did, what did you think right away when you first saw her? Uh, she had a son who was six, Jack. So uh, my oldest, that's my oldest son. And uh, I just, there's something about that captivated me was her with her son and her having fun and 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 it was just there was something that just triggered in my brain i'm like that she's that's the mother that you know to my children that's that's who i want to marry wow that's amazing that that was what that triggered yeah have you always been pretty instinctual um throughout your life with the things you liked i i guess they come to you right away most things i you know i've only ever been into few things and fishing is like you know the most that's been the most important thing up until having family of my own and uh just living and breathing that i didn't really have a choice um my parents bought a sailing catamaran when i was a baby and at six months of age we moved onto that boat and sailed up the east coast of east coast of australia and my nan was really concerned that i was going to learn to walk on a boat and not be able to actually work, walk properly <laughs> You'd be wobbling. Yeah, I'd be wobbling. And, and uh, so, you know, I was I had a little hand line tied off the side of the boat. And before I could, you know, before I could walk, I was catching fish. That was my That's toy. Crazy. That was that was the toy I had as a child was a hook and a piece of string. Wow. What, um, how did it progress? Because I think you were 17 years old when you were already a mate on an offshore boat. If yeah, I'm not mistaken. even sooner than that. Um, I Got my captain's license at 16, but, um, you know, I guess the story really, you know, starts long before that. My um, my father was a charter boat captain, and uh, he had a 38-foot hardwood boat. It was one of the original boats from Cairns that Bob Oliver owned. Uh, it was a Bracken, and uh, I remember the day he saw that boat. We were coming out the Urangan Harbour in Harvey Bay, my hometown, 
and we saw this boat on mooring with a for sale sign on it. And so we went over there and had a look and anyhow, dad ended up buying that boat and starting his first charter boat business and doing three-day liverboards off Fraser Island and pioneering that whole fishery because it right. was a long way. It was like, you know, 70 miles, you know, 60, 60 miles from the harbour to get out around the Sandy Cape and get, get outside the island. But there's great fishing in the sheltered waters. But then if you got on the outside where it was a lot rougher and harder to get to, there was a lot of untouched stuff. It was, you know, a brilliant fishery. And a lot of it was reef fishing in the early days. He had a thousand pound fish box on the boat and he'd have You'd half fill of it. Yeah, it was about filling, you know, people, you know, justified the expense of the trip was how many pounds of fish they brought home. And over the course of his, um, you know, time being a charter boat captain and, and that fishery was getting away from that. He just, you know, saw that there was no future in killing everything you caught and then getting into sport fishing. And uh, so I grew up on that every long weekend I could, I'd, I'd be a second deck end or if he was one person short i'd i'd skip some school and and get on board and and that was kind of you know i got to be a, a crew and and start my training with my father and my granddad was a fisherman as well not he didn't fish as a charter boat captain but uh, it was a way of life mm -hmm. so three you, generations you, you mentioned i want to talk about boats just quickly because you mentioned it was a it was a wooden boat mm -hmm. and i've heard before that certain boats raise fish Yep. Tell me about that. Yeah, the harmonics of the of the boat and the engine uh, vibrations and stuff. Yeah, yeah. If you don't have, you know, if if you you don't don't have have everything, you know, in tune and synced up, and there's vibrations, and you know, is that good? It, it mess. No, it's not good. I mean, if you do have a vibration and you're catching fish, keep it, keep it. You know, <laughs> but it, it's uh, it messes with your head. You know, if you're you're marlin fishing and you've got a vibration and you're not, you know, someone else is catching and you're not, it. It really messes with you, so you want to make sure that that's all taken care of. I was going to say, is that mental or is that actually factual about the fish? It, it seems factual. Really, it, it definitely plays a you know game in your head as well. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, and it wasn't. I, I read an article about you, and it wasn't until Rod Harrison wanted to fish with your dad, correct? Yeah. And your dad said, "You can come with me to Fraser, but you got to have my son. You got to teach my son how to fly cast." Yeah, that's right. We um, we we're into all sorts of fishing, and uh, my dad grew up freshwater fishing. There was a tournament on Boondoomba Dam, and uh, I think I was eleven at the time, ten or eleven, and uh, we went out to this competition. And Rod Harrison was doing demonstrations, and he was one of Lefty Cray's closest friends up until when Lefty passed uh, a few years ago. They talked still weekly at that point, and. You know, he'd be doing these demonstrations showing how far he could cast a fly with one back cast, you know, pull the rod of cast with half a rod, doing right hand mends around, you know, around hitting targets around a, a corner. And, you know, we were captivated seeing what he could do with a fly rod. And we got talking to him and uh, dad's like, well, you know, would you be interested in coming? Because he's a famous, you know, he's a celebrity. Rod Harrison is a fishing celebrity in Australia, but he was well rounded. It didn't matter what type of tackle or sure. he did just about everything. And uh, he said, yeah, I'd like to, you know, come and, you know, fish with you guys. And he brought a whole bunch of lures and, and so on and fly gear and flies. And part of the deal was teaching me how to cast a fly rod. So I got one of the best mentors at a very young age in Australia. And uh, Dean Butler was one of Rod Harrison's close friends. And, uh, you know, somehow they had been communicating and, and Butler had heard about the stories about this fishery off Fraser Island. And he was usually one of the first to try and get to an area to help pioneer and, and he wanted to be on the front line of anything that was happening. And so Dean was the next to come and he spent a couple of weeks with my father fishing. They did freshwater, they did offshore, they caught a whole host of species. And our particular area at Harvey Bay in Fraser Island, we have an overlap of species. We've got southern species and the northern species and it's kind of like we get an overlap. And in the Southern Hemisphere, anywhere you got the southernmost extreme, you know, of the tropical sport fish, you generally got the largest size of those fish. But then you also got the cold, good cold water, good eating fish as well. Oh, interesting. And uh, so we get bass and barramundi. This Australian bass is similar to a smallmouth bass. And those two, the bass is southern and the barramundi is northern. So getting an overlap right. of those two species was very unique. And we had eastern Mary River cod not too far away. And then you go further inland, we get the Murray cod, which is like a freshwater grouper. Mm. And uh, 
you know, so Dean got to see all kind of stuff. They caught cobia and there's marlin and tuna and, you know, bass and barramundi, all this stuff. And Dean was the first to say, he goes, you've got all these species. What else do you have? Do you have any flats fishing? You've got the largest sand island in the southern hemisphere. Is there anything to be caught in the, in the shallow water? And my dad goes, yeah, we've got these golden trevally. They come up in the shallow water and tail like permit and put their tail out. And, and Dean's like, what? And has your dad, did your dad fish for those or just see them? Yeah, yeah. He, he'd done some net fishing in his younger days, um, some gill netting um, a couple of days with some commercial fishing buddies. And uh, he witnessed that. And then there's a few other of our friends that targeted them with topwater plugs as well. And so he'd seen it. There's other stories. The Golden Tree Valley were a popular species that we, we'd catch. And uh, on bait, they weren't, weren't necessarily difficult to catch. But the fact that they came up in the shallow water and tailed, that really caught Dean's attention. He's like, okay, we need. To, do you think we could go and see that? And so the first day, Dad took him out to uh, Little Woody um, Island, and there's a beautiful big long sandbank off of, off of that island. And uh, I think they had the story was they had like 100 Golden Trevally tailing around them. They were swimming through their legs, and they couldn't get them to eat a fly. Like got to witness this amazing shallow water fishery, and they were difficult and, you know, to guys like Dean Butler and that's the, heaven on earth for Dean. Yeah, it's heaven on earth, you know, like being able to you know stalk those fish in shallow water and and but they're not easy. Did you finally figure out how to catch them? Yeah, pretty, yeah, we, pretty easily, or is it, they're they're like permit. They're always hard to catch. You know, they're, they're fast moving. Um, so you know, they come up in the shallow water and they're eating, sucking. The, they're fairly opportuni- opportunistic. Ghost shrimp was one of the popular, you know food sources in the shallow water, but they eat crabs and they eat bait fish of all different sorts. Um, but on the, on the sand flat, because they're, you know, they're spooky and uh, it's clear water and they swim very quickly and erratically. So they would tail and you think, okay, he was swimming this way. He's going to, you could lead the fly and, and, and no, he's going to swim off the other way. So being able to be a quick caster, be able to put a fly where it needed to be in a short amount of time or pick up a lot of line and recast without spooking them was, you know, was tricky. Mm-hmm. And, what, and what were these fish called again? Golden Trevally. Golden Trevally. Yeah. So they look similar to a permit. Yeah, similar to a permit. Yeah. yeah. Big golden tail. And right. so when they would tail on an incoming tide, sometimes they'd get up so shallow that they couldn't even stand their whole body out of the water. They'd flop over trying to tail and suck really? these ghost shrimp out of the sand or yabbies as we called them. And... uh you know, they grow, I mean, generally they were 15 to 20 pound fish, good size. There's 300 with a 16 pound tippet, there'd be a 300 yards run on the first run. Really? And if there was any mangroves or a stick or anything, they'd, they knew where it was, they'd go straight for it and were, break you off. Were people sight fishing marlin on the flats at the time? No, no, that didn't happen for quite some oh, time it didn't? after. Okay. Yeah, that was. But, but you were involved with the first one caught on the flats, weren't you? Yes, and it wasn't on fly. It was it was on spin. And uh, that particular day, um, you know, the the flats fishery, the Golden Trevally thing, that that sort of spiraled. You know, with Dean being there um, and and witnessing that, he said, "Look, this is a fishery. You guys have got to do something about." It. So they had an invitational um, tournament, and uh, my dad was still doing the offshore charters, and so they basically invited you know all the celebrities around Australia in the industry and uh, hosted this at Kingfisher Bay Resort on Fraser Island and a five-day tournament and everyone was really impressed with what they saw they're like this is a fishery somebody has to do something about this my dad was tired of doing these three-day liverboards I'd see him for maybe a couple of hours a week to, between changeovers sure. getting fuel and supplies and he's like I'd like to sleep in my own bed have a smaller boat and uh, you know pursue this and so that's he sold his offshore business and uh, bought a 19-foot Yamaha Southwind, which is basically like a Panga-style boat. Got a welder to make a polling platform and built a wow. casting platform on the on the front, kind of much like the spider platform that Chittam has today. Sure. And uh, imported a Loomis push pole and started guiding. And so that whole fishery, you know, took off. We had a lot of Japanese anglers, a lot of American anglers coming over, and he did that for quite some time. And, uh, you know, I was 11 when that all sort of kicked off. And uh, so we had all these different, you know, high profile guys coming to fish with us. You know, first was Rod Harrison, then was Dean Butler. Peter Morse was soon, you know, he's one of the you know greatest fly casters in Australia and instructors. And uh, he had his own television series and uh, writing for different magazines. So he came and he knew how passionate I was into fishing. 
And uh, Dean Butler showed me a picture when I was 11. This, and this is something that, that really changed the path of my life. I, I, I lived for fishing. That's all that I wanted to do. I couldn't think of doing anything else with my life. I didn't know where that was going to lead. I didn't know if it was going to be following my father's footsteps in you know, Harvey Bay or what. And Dean Butler showed me a picture. He was up in Cairns chasing the 50-pound test world record, conventional tackle, and they had a really big black marlin get eaten by the sharks, and it was probably big enough. Snook Fuller had the, it was like 1,150-pound fish, I believe, is the current record, and it was the record at the time, and this fish was probably going to challenge that. It was big. Sharks ate it, unfortunately. And Dean showed me a picture of that head when I was 11. Hmm. And the pectoral fins, you know, right near the gills, that's where it had been eaten off. The, the whole body of the fish was gone. It was just the head left. And the tip of the bill stood nearly as tall as he did in the cockpit of that boat. And when he showed me a picture of that head, right then and there, I'm like, I want to chase dinosaurs. That's what I want to do with my <laughs> life. I told mum and dad, that's what I want to do. And they said, well, you're not allowed to go overseas until you're 17 and you've got to get your high school certificate. In Australia, you're, you can get your high school certificate at 15 and then go get an apprenticeship or you can continue on with school and then go to college or university. A lot of my friends, I'm a small town, not a lot of my friends went to, to college. Most of them did get a trade of one sort or another. And I think I was 15 at the time. So I was in my last year of high school and Peter Morse had been fly fishing off Malula Bar with Kim Anderson in a sailfish, in a sailfish fly fishing tournament. And Kim was talking about how he needed a, a second mate to train for the following year up in Cairns. So Peter remembered how much I wanted to do that and called up and said, hey, Jared, I wasn't Dingo at that time. It was just Jared. Would you be interested in doing this? Oh, yeah, I'd love to. You know, can you get me in touch? And so talk to Kim Anderson. And uh, Kim's like, yeah, okay, well, you know, can't really afford to pay a second deckhand. And since you haven't done it, you're young before, you know, come up and meet us and, and uh, you know, get to, get to know you for a couple of days and then uh, we'll talk about it. And so I went up there and went fly fishing with his deckhand, Brendan Rolt. I caught some barramundi. I was... 15 at the time, and I was casting full length of fly line with one back cast and catching barramundi and outfishing Brandon. And Brandon's like, oh, this, this kid's keen. Like he's, you know, he has potential. I knew nothing about chasing marlin or, or, you know, doing the things that they were doing. But he saw potential and being able to train me up. And Kim said, all right, well, you know, $20 a week. You're going to have to be able to afford your own, you know, board and food, but we'll pay $20 you. $20 a week? Yeah, $20 a week. Jesus. And uh, this is just for the light tackle season, generally fishing 12-pound tests for the juvenile baby black marlin. And uh, they'd also done a lot of fly fishing for the black marlin, and they figured out they could tease these fish up and, and throw feathers at them, basically, and trick these marlin into eating that. And then they had all these light tackle 12-pound tournaments. They figured, well, if we can trick a marlin into to doing that, if we could tease them up and then pitch back a live bait with a, you know, on the 12-pound our hookup percentages are going to go through the roof because we're able to, to feed them so close to the boat and, you know. And you get the control. bite where the fish turns and goes away. It's it going away. I it, think it, that was the real key, right? Absolutely. Yeah. And so they were some of the first and they got really good. They're winning just about every tournament. This was bef before I started with them. So I went in learning how to tease. My first season light tackle was learning how to tease fish up to the fly and to pitch live baits to them. And so my training was, you know, those guys were so far ahead of their time with with doing all that. And that season, we won every tournament except for one. We placed second in one of the tournaments. And we also fly fished for one particular day from Townsville back, or sorry, Innisfail back to Cairns. And we brought a charter that charter on board for that trip. And we raised six marlin for the day and fish an IGFA 20 pound tippet. We were five for five on 80, 90 pound black marlin on the flight. Still the record most. Most black marlin caught on fly in one day. Wow. Uh, IGFA. And there was a sixth fish that came up that wouldn't tease, so we picked up 12 pound on the live bait and fed it back and caught that one as well. So caught, you caught them all. Caught them all. <laughs> <laughs> you had great mentors. Yeah. So I got to to see the light tackle fishery, and uh, but that was all I was going to be there for. The heavy tackle fishery cut starts in September and goes through the, till the end of November. And Kim had a second deckhand already organized a chef to be on board for that heavy tackle fishery. I was going to be going home. I didn't know what I'd be doing after that. I was really sad, you know. I was, got to experience all this and go home. Don't know what's next. And uh, I worked as hard as I could because I wanted to, you know, get an invitation back. You wanted to stay on that boat. I wanted to stay on that boat. And 
Unfortunately for the for the chef, Kim goes, all right, well, you know, he's showing some potential. It's nice to have somebody that's fishy on board and uh, maybe we'll put Gavin back a little bit. And poor Gavin, he was a chef. He'd already given his resignation to his job to come and do the season. And then Kim calls him up and says, no, we're going to push you back a month and give give Jared a month of heavy tackle fishing so he can have that experience and we can keep him on a little bit longer. And uh, that's where I got to see the you know, the giant black marlin for the first time. What, what was that like? What, what did you what, what did you think and what did you see and how did it make you feel when you saw that first big black marlin? It was very intimidating. I mean, we did so well in the light tackle fishery, those small one-year-old, two-year-old marlins that we were catching. Um, that was phenomenal. It was really exciting. And then to go and fish the 130-pound tackle for the big fish, and it was a slower season for, you know, what had happened in previously previous years. It was a tough year. So we didn't get to see too many big fish. It wasn't till late in the end of this, towards the end of the season or that month that I was fishing with Kim Anderson and Brendan Rolt. And uh, we'd gone all the way up to Lizard Island and fished all, all the way back down through the ribbon reefs. And we were at Linden Bank. We had one angler on board, a young Japanese guy. His parents bought him the trip and sent him over to fish with us for a few days. And uh, there was some yellowfin tuna feeding. We don't usually fish with live baits too much on the Great Barrier Reef because the sharks there. You got all this effort. They eat your to bait. Cut. Yeah, they end up eating it. We fish with dead baits mostly. But it'd been a tough year. We saw these 25, 30 pound yellowfin tuna. So we put out some jigs and caught caught a double header of like 20, you know, 25 pounders, I guess, in that class. And we rigged them up with circle hooks and put them out in the 130s. And, you know, a tuna of that size, when he's pulling it, it's really hard to put him in an outrigger clip and get enough tension where that when a fish eats it, it's going to release right. without problem. So we would hold onto him. We'd put a set of gloves on and hang onto the line and have a section of line pulled off the rod in the water. So when you eat, there was that slack line that they could eat the bait before you come tight to set the hook. Brennan's on one side with one arm on the other. Mine started getting nervous. And when a 25 pound yellowfin tuna starts getting nervous, you're like, Yeah, you got to hang on. You're hanging like this. He's getting freaking out and he's you getting know chased gonna, around. Do you, and you then, know you're going to get a bite? Uh, yeah, you got a really good idea that he's being chased. It's not like, you know, he's not doing that for no reason at all. He's, there's somebody there and he's shaking. And then Brendan's like, Yeah, I'm getting nervous too. So he's got the same thing going on. Next thing I get the big, thump. and you got to be real careful because the stretch in the, the monofilament, if you hold on too long, you know, too too long it's it's going to shoot up in your face so you got to kind of like hang on long enough you know he's actually got a hold of it and didn't miss it and feed it to him you're hand feeding the fish and brennan bit almost simultaneously but not at the same time it was like mine went and then his went and we try to keep them spaced apart so we don't get a fish eat both baits both got end up getting bit and uh push the drags up and driving forward trying to get a good hook set and both the rods are bending over about the same the lines are going in the same direction the water and we're thinking oh no we've had a fish that's eaten both baits and you know it's not ideal it hadn't been a great season for big fish we're still better than anywhere else in the world but not by great barrier reef standards i think we'd maybe caught a seven six seven hundred pound of that that you know earlier on a few weeks before that but we hadn't really seen any real big fish well anyhow the line started doing this, set going different directions and crossing over. So we're like, oh, it's not the same fish. That's good. We have to switch over. And we've got one angler on board, so we've got to pick which fish we go to the chair with. Well, the first one comes up and, and jumps, and it's a 600-pounder, and we're like, yeah, we're stoked because we hadn't seen many fish of that kind of class. And then the other one starts coming up, this baseball bat slowly just starts coming up out of the water just baseball like, bat that's the the bill the bill. The bill of the fish in slow motion it just starts tips just starts coming out of the water and it just keeps coming and keeps coming and keeps coming and this giant fish the bigger one big female and uh kim's like oh, it's over 1100 so we've got a double header 1100 and 600 pound fish i'm fighting the 600 pounder out of the gunnel now we've got the angler on the 1100 pound fish and uh we ended up losing the 600-pounder. We weren't too worried about that. We were more worried about the big fish. But that was my first big marlin experience. And I didn't have, get the gloves on. I, you know, I was a crew, a mate in training. So that was that, that was Brennan's fish. I, you know, had we caught a lot of fish that year and maybe, you know, I might have gotten a chance to, to get some more leadering experience. But I got to lead a 200-pounder and, uh, you know, I, I'm glad the cameras weren't around because I'm sure it was hideous to watch my technique or lack thereof. 
Um, but that month's kind of come to an end. And as as that was finishing and I was about to, okay, here I go. I'm going to go back to Harvey Bay again. I don't know what's around the next, where I'm going next, what I'm going to be doing. And I call over the radio, Ross McCubbin, his his second deckhand had gotten a staph infection in his knee and was going to be in the hospital getting taken care of. He needed somebody to fill that, you know, that guy's position. Kim's like, Jared, Roscoe needs a needs a mate. Would you be interested? I'm like, oh, yes. And it was like perfect timing. Like we were coming back into port. He was in port. I grabbed my duffel bag, threw it on to the lucky strike and off I went with Ross and and uh, Justin Reed or Flash is as he was known his his uh, his number one crewman, and Flash was a world traveling deckhand. He'd fished all over and a wealth of knowledge. So I was able to, you know, I learned some, you know, a, you know, really important foundation and and, and uh, stuff with Brandon and Kim. But then I'm going on with a, a completely different team that have done fish different fisheries. So I was able to learn, you know, other stuff as well. Flash was really good on the leader. And uh, one of the techniques that he taught me in that t- short time that I was on for the rest of the summer, rest of the uh, black marlin season, was how to take backhand wraps. So, you know, when you're fishing for these big marlin on the, you know, heavy tackle or, or whatever, and the fish gets up close and grab all the leader, most people take, you know, double wraps to try and beat this fish and subdue it, get a tag or a gaff in the fish. And, um, uh, there was a technique of leadering the marlin backhand wrap that had been developed for the giant bluefin tuna. And not many people knew about it at that point in time, but Flash did. And so anyhow, he would practice with me, would use a piece of rope and he would teach me how to break the leader over the back of my hand and get a backhand wrap. And then once you got one, then you could go for a quick second. And that was that was really important because I was able to, you know, take that skill set on and, and practice and, and learn that before I even got a real chance to do much leadering. I'd had some some really great mentoring doing that. But that is really, really important uh, because you have to understand and learn how to hold that fish, be it, but be also to be able to let go. Yep. And, know and, when to and, hold and on be, and, and know and when to let go. And I get ripped out of that boat. Yep. And so be- hold on. The traditional way that you wrapped, it was just basically wrapping the monofilament around your palm. Correct? Yeah. So you grab the leader when it came up um, and, you know, you'd pull the leader down to you and it'd palm up and thumb out and the leader, you'd hit it in be- in this part of your hand yep. and you would wrap it around like right. this and get two wraps. You go from the inside over the top. Yep. That's right. And so a backhand wrap, the line, the lead is going to be exactly the same in your hand, but instead of wrapping something to you, you, you're getting the leader like this, you can grab it and you're breaking this part of the leader back over your thumb so you can get a wrap on your hand, but not have to pull anything to you. And so there wasn't as much resistance. When there's when you're fighting, there's a lot of pressure over rod, especially heavy tackle. Trying to get a wrap when it's pulling really, really hard, you just can't. You can't. You physically, right. you can try all you want to try and get a wrap, but... But you can't. But if you could do this and you break it over your thumb this way, so, you get so a single wrap. You, you reach. Yep. You reach out like this and you're gonna, the leader's coming down like that. So oh, you off have, the outside of your hand. Yep. You hit it on the back of your hand and you break you break it over your hand. You can gra- You can kind of grab it with your fingers like this. And that line is still in a – you haven't got a wrap at this point. But from here, you use the other hand to bring it around your thumb. Oh, and that cr- gotcha. creates a full wrap on your hand. Yeah, so so you the other hand, your left hand, is really helping you out with that wrap. That's right. Yep. Yeah. Yep. So you're back wrapping it. That's what it's Interesting. called. Interesting. And then once you've done that, then you've got some purchase. You've got something to be able to pull with. And then, you know, you can even use your spare hand. Two hands are better than one. You can kind of try and pull and lift that fish and then get a quick, you know, second wrap. How, Never how take more t- than two. How tight is that on your hand? Your hands get crushed. I've got a set of gloves I'll, I'll show you. Do you ever break bones? I haven't, but it's very possible too. If you're if you don't have good gloves and you don't know what you're doing, yeah, you can break. I've you know, I've got pieces of cartilage loose in my hands from, from you know that. you know big fish jumping on the leader, and you know when the leader when you do let go when it comes off and comes over across your knuckles, it's coming up like makes a shotgun sound off your hand sometimes. Do you ever pull skin? No, even through gloves. No, no, no the gloves I, I, save you. Yeah, I'll show you. They're they're serious. You know, you don't muck around. You right. Have all different caliber gloves. You know, from light to heavy for different situations and tackle size. But it, is that your biggest fear as a mate getting yanked over by a big fish? Well, that was one of the things I was taught that season. Was there was those who have been pulled in and those who have not yet. Always have respect. It's just like a captain. There's those who have run aground and those who have not yet. So right. 
Doesn't matter how long you've been doing it, you've got to. Have you been yanked over? Fortunately, I have not joined the Underwater Wyman's Association. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me about Dean, because Dean Dean got pulled over and got back, and the boat backed over him, right? Bob Jones ran over him, yeah, and uh, cut the tendons in his hand. So, like the finger, his fingers here, uh, they, they can't open. They can't open. They're permanently like that. And so, were you with him on that boat? No, that was long before. before. That was way, way back. Yeah. Do you know the story well? Can you? Can you? I mean, that's it? pretty much the gist of it. So I mean, they were backing down on a fish, and Dean had a hold of a big fish. Big fish on the leader, and it snatched him over. And uh, you know, you've got to be as a captain, you've got to be prepared for what could happen. And there's not much you can do about it. You know, you got the momentum coming back, and you could be in a rough condition or whatever. But if he gets snatched over, that is one of the concerns. You're going to come right, continue on, and drive right over top of the the person that got pulled in the water. So you've got to be ready to, you know, shift back, back into neutral and, and, and if, you you know. Stop the boat. Stop the boat, not run over him. But in that case, um, you know, Dean got run over and, you know, the, the propeller cut his cut his arm and, and cut those tendons, and uh, which makes him deadly on a gaff because he can hang onto that T-handle <laughs> on, a, on a fixed head gaff not for a marlin go. and not let go. <laughs> and he's been just... snatched in twice, I think, on like 500-pound marlins on a fly rod. He's fearless. He is. He has no fear. That dude, <laughs> he'll he'll dive headfirst into the fire. I remember when we were in Panama with Tom and Dean. Um, Dean was going after a marlin record or something, and he invited us down to catch the sea turds, as he as he calls them, the sailfish. And I remember I I haven't done much offshore fishing, but Dean, I'm sure you did this too. But he would always hold on to the tip of the rod. For like ten the, hours a the day, the teaser rod, the teaser rod, feeling it for a bite, feeling it for a bite, and he would not let go. Yep, he didn't eat lunch. He didn't. He would not let go of that tip. Yep, all day long. And I was like, "Geez, that's some persistence." And, and the and the and the fishing was so slow and boring. It's like, yep. And the other mate that was on the boat, not that Dean's a mate, uh, he's the gaff guy. He's Dean's he's, the gaff guy. He's everything. He the runs center, that cockpit. He's the center of that whole operation. Right. You know, he he's great behind the wheel but you know he organized he orchestrates pretty much the entire operation right yeah that's where the chaos happens yeah i mean you know so i got my start there for that season on the reef and uh then i got a taste of the heavy tackle and i got to see that giant fish and that was you know dean showed me a head of a fish that he had lost a dinosaur and that's what i wanted to do the rest of my life but when i finally got an actual taste of seeing a giant fish you know over you know over however big we don't know estimating it's big fish kim called it 1100 and that double header and then i got to go on with with uh ross mccubbin and flash and learn from those guys and uh you know so that there's a few things i was taught on my first year in the reef that are very important because that's one of the biggest heavy tackle fisheries in the world the most experienced guys and as a young guy coming in you're taught to be very you know not to have an opinion to be very quiet don't don't have an opinion and anybody that's worth listening to when you're back at port or wherever it might be at the bar if there's anybody talking that interest that has experience you just quietly come over close and and be a fly on the wall and listen and learn don't don't start talking because you haven't seen you know, you've got to spend a lot of years there before, you, you know, your opinion matters. You can have an opinion, just don't voice it. Right. So Because there's always somebody who's got a, who, who knows more. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. But and, was was that was the captain telling you that for kind of recon for the boat or was he telling you that just my for own good. Your, my your own, own good? My yeah. own good, yeah, because your reputation. Don't look like a fool. Don't look like a fool. And, uh, you know, if your own reputation. Those guys, you know, in that – heavy tackle fishery on the Great Barrier Reef, there's more fish over 900 pounds caught there in three-month season than the rest of the world catches an entire year by a lot. So there's only 30 boats there each year, roughly, maybe a little bit more. And so those guys get to see so many more big fish than anyone else. And that's what, you know, as a if you're a mate that got to have experience there, that opens doors to you because you've right. had more experience with big fish for tournaments than anybody else when it comes down to it. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know having the background of the light tackle and the fly fishing that was huge as well so now you know you can fish any kind of tackle you can bait and switch chase records heavy tackle so that really helped open doors for me and you know the following year i was able to to go down to new zealand and and fish with john batterton and, and ross mccubb and after fishing with him flash was building a boat and was going to be a captain now ross needed a new number one for the following year and ross said well jared would you like to be my number one deckhand 
And, uh, you know, I was 16 my first season, so I was at 17 years of age, which comes back to your question there before, was when I, my first opportunity to be the number one deckhand and run the cockpit. And I was green. Like, I, you know, I'd had some great training, but, you know, nothing prepares you for it. You, I, I heard you only wired one Marlin at the time. Is that yeah, correct? that's right. And now you're number one mate. That's right. How nervous were you? Really nervous. So before the, the season kicked off with Ross McCubbin, I helped Bob Jones do a delivery and uh, catch bait before the season, catching scad and scaly mackerel. And we had some great bait fishing. So, um, and the weather was beautiful. So Bobby Jones says, put some 130s out, put some lures out, and we're going to troll the rest of the way up to Cairns on our way to, to go start the season. We ended up getting a 900 pound black marlin and um, other crew on the boat got in the, in the chair and, and uh, I got to lead in my first big fish, giant fish over, you know, it was huge. I don't know, you know it was well over 900 pounds. And, uh, you know, first time I grabbed a, grabbed the leader and got a set of wraps, that thing just climbed out of the water and ripped the leader out of my hands. I felt my feet come off the deck pretty much, you know, got that weightless feeling just as I'm like, okay, time to let go. And Bobby's screaming, don't let go. You know, as most captains <laughs> there do, they're screaming at you because there's sharks. And if, you you know, longer you fight these fish for, the, the greater the risk of them end up getting eaten. So, you know, they're screaming at you not to let go, but you've got to have the common sense when, when to. Right. Because, uh, you know, it's... Fishing, I think we were using 600 pound leader at the time, but years later I ended up using 900 pound leader, and it's not gonna not gonna break. You're gonna get pulled in before it breaks. Jeez, that's that's 900 um, pound leader. Yeah, hang that's on, like this cable. How would you huge. get the name Dingo? Oh uh, well, that that kind of came that came that year, I guess. Um, so that fish I'm talking about, 900 pounds. After we caught it and let it go, I was up in the, the flybridge with Bobby Jones. He goes, what's your father's phone number? I tell him. He calls up my dad on the phone. He goes, congratulations, Sid. Your boy is now a man. <laughs> so my dad loved that phone call. I've heard him tell that story wow. you know, later on. But, yeah, uh, sure. You know, getting the f first opportunity to, to um, you know, pull on a big fish like that. And uh, – Earlier that year, I was in New Zealand and uh, fishing with John Batterden. John Batterden's and he got you know been a part of a lot of world records since. At that time, you know he'd been fishing in Hawaii and Madeira and the Great Barrier Reef and had his own operation in New Zealand. I went down there to chase striped marlin with them. And before going down there, you know he goes, "Look, I want to let you know that these are the biggest striped marlin you're ever going to see and the roughest seas you're ever going to have fished in. Well, it was the calmest season they'd ever had and the smallest run of striped marlin they ever had. We did catch some big, big striped marlin. You know, I think we weighed them up to like, you know, 140 kilos, so 300-pound stripies and, um, you know, saw some maybe bigger than that as well. And he started calling me Dingo and because uh, I was Australian, but it kind of fit because where I come from, Harvey Bay or Fraser Island is where I grew up fishing around has the last purebred dingoes because there's no dogs allowed on the island, so there's been no crossbreeding. When I saw you at the trade show at ICAST last year, yep. you came walking over to the Hardy booth, and I saw your name tag. It said, Jared Boschhammer. <laughs> and I'm looking at your face. I'm looking at your name tag, and everything, everything, I was spinning. Going, what? <laughs> you know? Because <laughs> everybody knows you as dingo. You get that nickname, and that's it. That's right. But it was, it, the, there's a great article in Angler's Journal right here, you know, and over here in the right-hand corner, the very fishy dingo, Boschhammer. I mean, it really profiles your life prolifically. Um, but I'm really interested in the, the fishy dingo. It's amazing how certain people have that, that sense. And what I find, because um, I'm not an offshore guy, how do you do you have that same sense? I know that you're a great fisherman up in Jupiter. You've you've been all around the world catching these big fish. Tell me about the dynamics of, of fishing for granders as far as a captain and when you're in the back. Uh, I know that something really big is down there. There's a sea monster down there. And when we were in Panama, I asked the other mate, I said, How do you have the patience to go day hours and hours and days? and be focused with not a break of concentration. It really helps to experience and, those fish and once he, you've seen them. That's what he said. He said, I am riveted because I know what's down there. Yeah. Yep. Once you've experienced them, you're like, how, wherever I've got to be, 
what have I got to do to be able to see more of those? Like whatever that was, I want more of that. I want, you know, that giant creature, you know, jumping out of the water and, you know, what they can do. I, you know, I want to test myself. I want to test the gear. I want to be a part of the team. And, you know, it's for a young guy like me that, you know, it's expensive sport. Mm-hmm. There's no way that I was ever going to be able to do that without, you know, the help of people that can afford to do it. Right. And that was another thing that I was taught right early on is, you know, make it, try and make yourself invaluable, a part of the team. And, uh, you know, so that you do get those opportunities. And, um, you know, because the people that can afford to have these operations, they, they're running business, their own companies and businesses. They can't afford to be there. They don't know anything about that, but they need, you know, experienced captains and crews mm-hmm. maintaining sure. the gear and keeping everything at the highest level. So when they do have the time to come and use their gear, it's ready. Like, and you have a well-oiled team and, and it's professional. You go, because it is a team. It's, it's a huge team, team effort. And, uh, you know, you're only good good as your uh, you know your weakest link. Exactly right. Did you ever have a chance to actually f- fish for a big fish and, and catch one yourself? Yeah, yeah. I've been able to be in the chair for some big fish. Um, probably the, the the best week of fishing or ten day charter I ever had it was the best fishing I ever saw on the reef. And uh, the Lizard Island tournament was going on at the time. We had a big group charter. We had three game boats on a mothership and. Uh, the organizer of it was an Three angler. Three game birds, what's that mean? Game boats, sport fishers. Game boats. Oh, okay. Yep. And uh, we had three game boats to to be able to accommodate all the anglers that we had for this one group charter. And Jay Meyer was the the organizer of it. And uh, he and his wife, Candace, and they brought, you know, other, other guests in. And uh, there's a couple of young guys, um, Jason Holtz and Oski Rice that were mating for Skip Smith at the time and they'd been traveling all over the Atlantic Ocean and they're just down in Brazil and Oski had weighed um, both Pacific and Atlantic grander blue marlin but they only, there's three species that grow over a thousand pounds and uh, you know to be able to complete that slam the only way you can really get an opportunity to do that is go to the Great Barrier Reef so Jay flew Oski over and Jason to give them the opportunity to be a part of that. And it just happened to be the best fishing I ever saw. The Lizard Island tournament was going on at the time. It's a seven-day tournament. The hours of fishing are pretty short. You only fish from 11 in the morning till f- I think Lions Out was, um, you know, maybe at 5 o'clock in the afternoon. Is that because of a tide issue? Uh, well, it's, you know, a lot to do with the fishery, those fish migrating there. It's, you know, it's not they're not really there so much for food. It's, it's a spawning ground. So those giant fish all congregate to that particular area and a concentrated in that area for a short amount of time september through the end of november but why do you only fish such a short day one of the important things each day is catching fresh bait because we're towing these dead baits there's a lot of barracuda and wahoo and dog tooth tuna stuff chopping you know chopping off your baits you've got mm-hmm. to keep replenishing your bait supply um and you can get morning bites but it seemed like the end of the day so after three o'clock especially you know four five six o'clock in the afternoon a lot of the bites came and and it was not so much the fish were there to feed. It was their ch- last chance to have a snack maybe before nightfall. And um, hmm. so we'd get that late afternoon bite. So the reason why it was it started at 11 is so the the boats had time to get their bait for the day. That's right. Yeah, bait and the best fishing was in the afternoons. And uh, I guess there was, I think there was 30, I think it was 32 boats fishing that tournament at that time when we had that charter. And there was 40 fish over 900 pounds caught in those seven days between 32 boats. Wow. Oh my gosh. Wow. It was incredible. Like at one point in time, I mean, every boat you could see on the horizon were all hooked up to giant fish. Really? I mean, the, because you're, the fleet is in a pretty small area. Yeah, everyone kind of found, you know, got moved in. It was like number 10 Ribbon Reef was fishing really well at the time. And, uh, you know, I forget, you know, you know how many boats were around us at one time. I think I could see nine boats and we were all, all nine boats had a fish on. Had a fish on at the same time. And they're all like eight, 900 pound, bigger, huge fish. And just, I mean, the energy that was going on right then was just incredible, you know, like can't even sleep at night. You have to have some pretty stout rum drinks to be able to pass out because <laughs> otherwise you're just, you know, so excited to get up and go again tomorrow. And that seven days or 10 days we were fishing with that group over that seven-day tournament, we caught 20 fish in those, those 10 days and uh, 10 of them were over 800 pounds and we ended up weighing two fish over 1,000. 
And uh, Oski, my deck, my second crewman, he had family problems, so he left right before that trip started. And Oski came in just to be a guest, and I said, Oski, would would you be my number two crewman? And I mean, as as more as an equal, even though he'd never fished there before, he was very talented, um, you know, heavy tackle wireman and and crewman. And I said, don't worry about the bait stuff, I've got that. But you know, it'd be really good to have you on board, you know, as a second crew and back me up, and then we'll switch out, we'll take turns on the leader. And so he flew in for like, you know, the best time ever. And uh, we got a big fish in the tournament. And uh, it was a release tournament. So if you kill a fish, um, you know, for a world record or something, it doesn't count towards your, you know, they'd stopped it. Previous years, they had a heaviest fish in the tournament. But at this, this point in time, they'd stopped having a weight, you know, heaviest fish category they wanted to preserve the fish and fish conservation became a priority yeah that definitely become you know very important and so if you do happen to kill a fish it doesn't count to the tournament we had a big fish on and i knew oski needed it that the, that the grand grander. black marlin to be able to finish off the the triple crown of grander marlins and uh we got this big fish the angler was jim perkins and uh we got the fish tagged got the for the tournament on the leader and Oski cut the leader off behind me. So what happens is once we've you know caught the got the fish on the leader, and uh, the other the mate the other mate will come and cut the leader, and you've got to set a wrap so that you can hang on as long as you can. If the fish takes off, you let him go, and he's gone. You know the hook's going to hopefully dissolve and go away later on, but he's going to get away healthy. If the sharks get on him, you can let go of him really quick, and hmm. um, you know if he takes off, you're not going to be fighting him for another however long and tire him out too much. So I was cut off on the leader. And Oski and I, I'm asking Oski, how big do you think he is? And Oski's just going, I don't know, dingo. It's big. What do you think? I said, I don't know. It's right there. It's big. And uh, Lukey's like, all right, cut him off. Let him go. Is Even though I'm cut off behind, we'll reach down and cut him off close to the mouth, you know, remove excess leader. Well, I didn't want to let go of that fish. So I'm hanging on the leader. We were actually clutched ahead in gear and the fish is down swimming, you know, I was getting worked over the gunnel, hanging onto this giant fish, trying to shorten it up, getting it closer. And Lukey's looking at his electronics and thinking about, you know, where we were from the course of the fight as to where he's going to make his next tack to try and get an, our next fish. So he's looking at his electronics and looking around, getting ready to plan where he's going to be trolling. And the boat's in gear and I'm hanging on this giant fish. Oski's looking out with me and Lukey looks back down, expecting to see baits getting fired back out and we're, ready, you know, fishing again. And here I am getting worked over the gunnel of the boat, hanging on the fish, and, and Lukey's like, what the fuck are you guys still doing with that fish? I'm like, I don't know, Lukey. You reckon it will go? And he's like, oh. he climbs down from the tower of the boat, climbs all the way down. I'm still hanging on, getting worked. He looks over the side of the boat, looks at the fish, and goes, all right, you can take it. <laughs> How big was it? It was a 1,018. So it just made it. It was a little close. Wow. But it completed the triple crown for Oski, and he was, uh, I think he was the second second person to ever do that. Um, Kevin Nakamaru was the first. In fact, Kevin Nakamaru had completed the triple crown twice before anybody else had been a part of. And you don't, you know, the, there's captains, crew, and angler. Any any one of those, you know, positions, if you were a part of a team that caught that fish, you can say that, right, you, sure. you know, you, you, got you weighed a grander and, and you had a chance at triple crown so you know kevin had been you know captain and mate for you know two two triple crowns before oski was the second to ever complete it and you've caught you've been a part of over 20 or twenty five thousand pound plus marlin yes that's amazing yeah and it's a small number compared to my peers that started before me and are still doing it now really yeah a quick, a quick question here what makes a good angler when you're catching thousand pound fish, because I, I I see these boats backing down and you're lifting and cranking. Is it a, is it a, is it an art form that I don't understand? It's just like anything. The more you do, the better you get. But what makes a good what makes a good angler when you're sitting in a chair lifting and cranking? Knowing the gear, knowing the limits, and knowing the team around you and how you know without any cues, without screaming and yelling. Great teams. Because it's a, it's a team sport. Great teams. You know, Luke Fallon was one of the captains that I fished with most of my career. We knew what each other was thinking. We fished together so much. And so if you have an angler that you've fished with as well, just knowing 
you know, the cues like, okay, you can hear the, you know, what's going on with the engine and boat handling, start seeing the angle of the line coming up. Okay. Fish is coming up to jump and boats now starting to come in reverse and, you know, get ready to crank. Um, you know, if you're fishing, you know, 130 pound test tackle, no one, no one, the limits, like, you know, if the fish is making a big smoking run where he's got gone down deep and has a big belly of line, you know, blue marlin, a pos- you know, they have the ability to break a 130 pound test line with the reel and free spool, just with the, the res- drag, just with the line drag going through the water. If they go down and they change direction a few times, and then when they go accelerate to come and jump, just that the the drag of that line being pulled through the water. If you don't go all the way back to free spool, you know you can. And if you go back to free spool and you've got line peeling off like that, you've got to know what you're doing, controlling that spool, not to get a big backlash. So, you know, there's not very many great heavy tackle anglers. There's very few just because, you know, the amount of experience you've got to have to be considered, in my opinion, great. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, costs a lot of money as well. Costs a lot of money and, and to have that many opportunities, you know, there's, there's there are some great anglers. Um, Hal Chittam, you know, there's a story of Hal Chittam. He'd go over and fish on the reef for a month at a time and fish with Hayden Bell and the Don't Ask Me. And there's a story that I heard early on in my career that still makes the hair stand up the back of my neck of, you know, thinking of, you know, the limit of, you know, how was probably the only one that I know that trained you know, months before he would go to the Great Bow Reef. He had a 130 set up in his living room. He'd crank, turn the handle, have the, the, the rod, you know, tied off and would crank against 40 pounds of drag and he would train to be able to crank against that resistance. You're not gaining any line. He was just turning turning the handle against 40 pounds and he'd do that for 40, 40 you know, 45 minutes every night. Strengthening that Strength, shoulder. Get, you know, that's what he considered, you know, like if, to be a great angler, you had to be able to endure, you know, these big fights with lots of drag. And we're using a lot more drag than 40 pounds, but to be able to turn a handle against 40 pounds is that's crazy. And I, I, I can't imagine that. I couldn't do it. Did you train to be a wire man to hold those oh, yeah, big all fish? The time, what all kind the time. of training would you do? Just lifting weights and certain specific oh, exercises? Just like, just like you do with a fly rod. Um, but going back to, you know, what, you know, really impressed me about Hal is one of the stories I heard about Hal's, you know, they caught an 800 pound fish, really big fish. A lot, a lot of people's dream fish, well, Hal caught plenty of those. And uh, they got some jumps on the leader and the fish, you know, took off and they were fighting it. And he's come all the way up on the drag to sunset, which sunset is all the way as far as you can go. Like, sunset, and the reason it's sunset. called sunset is, I, I guess, from the Great Barrier Reef because we have these light, late fights in the afternoon. And when the sun's going down, you go all the way with the drag because, you know, you're going to fight them into the night. And then you've got to come back in through these narrow cuts into the reef. And it's, you know, you, you want to try and avoid that if you can. So back in the early days, you know, in the corner with the drag is known as going, going to sunset. And uh, that's so funny. Stop them or pop them. He was using a, a, a reel that had drags that had been, you know, tinkered with by cow sheets over on the west coast of the US. And uh, so, you know, instead of being 70 pounds of drag in the corner and still have a good range all the way back to free spool, it had like, I think, 90 pounds of drag in the corner. So Hal's got 90 pounds of drag. And he's got his hands in the spool and he is watching the bend in the rod and he's squeezing, not letting any line come off the reel and watching the rod, watching the rod, watching the rod, pow, breaks it off. And Hayden's Hayden's really good fisherman, but he's a savage. And, uh, you know, even to his clients, he can be, you know, a savage, but those that love him, love I, I, I love Hayden and uh, he's a beauty. He, he looks down the hill, he goes, what are you doing, mate? Fucking broke off me good swivel, mate. That's a $35 swivel you broke off there, you cunt. <laughs> you owe me that. Oh, you know, getting off him. <laughs> I love the way you guys speak. <laughs> that is funny. What a, what an amazing arena. Is the is the fishing on the on the reef still as good as it used to be? It, you know, it comes in, in waves, you know, good years and bad years. A, a slow year on the reef, you're still going to, you know, see more giant fish than just about anywhere else. But, um, you know, it's hard to say, you know, we take it for granted those fish show up each year and the currents that don't always do the same things. It's just, you know, sometimes those fish don't have to be too far out in the coral sea and you don't, they don't come all the way in. Um, and, and then there's the times when they do and, you know, that, that magic week I, t- I was telling you about where, you know, so many giant fish were caught. When the conditions are right and, and they're there, it's you, you would think if you didn't know better, you think the ocean was full of those giant fish. 
It's, pr- it's possibly, too, when that current is just right and they push all this fish up against the edge. Exactly what happens. Because Madeira was so great for so many years, then all of a sudden it died. Yep. And, and then it came back a little bit, if I'm did. not mistaken. And then this year, the Azores, they had, um, you know, te- water temperatures were right for the Azores and they had phenomenal I fishing saw that. this year. Yeah, yeah, I saw that. Did you, did you chase the Marlin tour? I did. Yep. Ended up fishing in 20 countries over my, you know, 20 years that I've, I've been fishing for a living for 26 years now licensed for 26 and uh 20 years of of hard you know marlin fishing i met my wife and settled down and i was you know that's that put it in basically there was a timer on on my fishing marlin fishing career and and traveling you know we're going to have children together and you know there's no future in in that for a family before you met your wife was the goal to be a captain in the Great Barrier Reef. Yeah, I'd still, yeah. I'll be still chasing marlin. Yep, uh, I got to fish with some great people. Laurie Wright was among one of the greats that I got to fish with. Just one of the greatest professionals and and wise, you know, gentlemen of the sport. And uh, my best mate Dave Cassar and myself both got to crew for for Laurie for his last three years full time as a as a captain on the reef. And uh, Laurie was grooming us to kind of take over from from him, whether it be Dave and I had an operation together or whether we had our own operations, but he wanted to then, you know, book charters for us. And and that's where, I'll, you know, what I was working towards. I love being in the cockpit, you know, getting to lead those giant fish and being in the action. I lived and breathed for it. Marlin were as important as air to me for most of my life. I didn't care about anything else. I got up in the morning because, you know, just the hunt for those giant fish. And most of my life was spent chasing fish over 700 pounds. That was, I didn't really care about, you know, they're all fun. I loved them all, but that was what I spent my life pursuing was, you know, from one destination to the next was chasing giants. Light tackle was great, you know, world record fishing with light gear and testing the limits. And then, you know, getting to fish with Dean Butler and Tom Evans and, uh, you know, catching those fish on fly and trying to break those records. So I think, you know, two most exciting things in the, in the sport fishing, um, you know, that I got to experience was leadering fish over 900 pounds, that, that rush, that excitement of, you know, being able to pull on those fish and try and, right. you know, break their will and, and, sure. and subdue, subdue those giant fish when they jump out of the water and you're, you know, hanging onto those things. And then the other was, you know, right up there with those was, you know, gaffing marlin on a fly rod with a, with a fixed head gaff because there's no rope. It's just, you know, when you, when you, came tight on a on a fish with a fixed head gaff it was like you know you got struck by lightning it's that that feeling of it's now is so quick and and you know that you know you everything you've got to hang on you and the fish so much harder to catch a big fish on fly because you don't have that, that don't the have flying the gaff don't have the leader to pull on or the or the rope yeah tell me about the uh, the bermuda uh series Mm-hmm. Where you guys brought that boat, um, you know, all the way across and fished Bermuda, won that series. T- tell me about that. So, and that story is probably the longest story I have, <laughs> and that's like a whole. Di- that could be a whole different, you know, sit down podcast. Um, they were shutting down the Great Barrier Reef. Although well, trying to, the Greenies have been trying to close that close that down for a long time. And Just stop uh, the fishing, stop the killing, stop everything. And there wasn't much killing going on. And the handful of guys there were very respectful, and and uh, um, it was pretty much catch and release. It, there was very little pr- pressure on the on the reef system at all. And uh, there's a lot of commercial fishing that went on, and that's a whole long story about the commercial sector and the Greenies and you know pol- politics and that whole thing. But that the short story is they're trying to shut it down. And uh, it was a big fight. Laurie Wright and a bunch of other guys got together and, and basically showed how many people were traveling from around the world, um, you know, and how much money they were spending. And nothing was really getting taken. It was catch and release and, and how little pressure, but how much money was being brought into the Australian economy. And so we got back. We had to give some areas where we no fishing zones, and we won some important areas back where we were still allowed to carry on a fish. But before, before that win... It was very scary and all I'd ever done from graduating high school was trained to do this and that was uh, once I experienced the Great Barrier Reef, I said, I, I don't want to miss a season on the Great Barrier Reef as long as I live unless something life-altering happens like getting married and here we are, this is going to be taken away from us. So I'm like, well, these marine resource managers that are, you know, 
making up these rules and and trying to shut us down none of them have actually spent any time real world time out on the great barrier reef they don't even know what's out there or what what's going on how about one of our own go back and and uh get one of these degrees so when it looked like it was going to get closed down i went back to school and uh, to be a marine resource manager marine biology coastal zone management and so on go to school spent all the money i'd saved marlin fishing for all these years on education and then we won the reef we won basically we won we were able to go back and do what we continued to do but i had no money left so i'm like all right well i'm gonna go and fish the tournaments over here in the u.s and experience that hopefully get a chance to go to bermuda because bermuda had um you know this history of giant fish both hawaii and bermuda in the world cup had been trading it off just about equally it was a really good place if you're going to fish the the world cup or the fourth of july it's a tournament that gets held around the world for that one day biggest blue marlin wins oh really and uh there'd been been this pretty well equal trade-off that was you know two de best destinations to be able to have a chance at a you know of a giant blue marlin that day and uh so i'm like all right i want to have a chance at, at doing this so my travel agent told me the closest place she could get me to the outer banks where i would start this journey was charlotte she had no idea how far Charlotte was from Cape Hatteras. So I get into Charlotte at midnight and I've got no money left to my name. And I'm like, all right. So it's late at night and everything's closed except the Hertz car rental place. I go and talk to the guys in the Hertz car rental and they're like, oh, you're a long way from Cape Hatteras. And uh, I'm like, yeah, I can't really afford to rent a car to get there from here. I'm like my travel agent was terrible. This is really bad advice and I hadn't done my homework very good. So how am I going to get there? Do you have any buses? And they're like, oh, you got Greyhound buses. I'm like, oh, Greyhound buses are great in Australia. Let's go do that. So downtown Charlotte at, you know, one o'clock in the morning. I'm, you know, I learned what the term OG meant that night. <laughs> I was feared, feared for my life. And, you know, next bus was leaving to go to, you know, Raleigh, Raleigh to Moorhead City at like five, four or five in the morning. So I just had to live and just make, you know, without getting robbed or whatever until then and get on a bus. And I made my way to, um, to Moorhead City in Moorhead City, I met this you know little couple that had the the bus shelter there, antique store, and they were closing up shop in the afternoon when I got finally got there. And I'm like, oh, you know, how do I get to Cape Hatteras from here? Like, oh, you're still away from Cape Hatteras. Like, I keep hearing that. <laughs> uh, so how do I get there? And I said, well, from here you go down to Cedar Island. From Cedar Island, ferry across Okokoko, Okokoko across the Hatteras, and and uh, you know I'm like, well, how far from here to Cedar Island? Oh, it's you know probably seventy dollar cab. It's going to be expensive cab fare to get there. But they're like, we had this little seafood restaurant we hadn't been to in a while. If you hang around and help us close up shop, you know we'll take you on out there. So I did. I helped them close their shop up, and they drove me out, and I gave them some gas money for doing that. Last ferry had already gone, so I couldn't get across to Okoko. Well come back to Driftwood Motel where the restaurant is and I booked a room for the night so I'd get on the ferry the next morning I ran into that couple again and they said come have dinner with us so the gas money I gave them they bought dinner for you know we sat down had dinner next morning basically hitchhiked my way all the way to, to Cape Hatteras I didn't know that hitchhiking in the US was dangerous couldn't believe that so many cars would go by me and not stop I'm like these people are so rude and then later on <laughs> I find out how you know how risky it is to to, to hitchhike so uh, that was quite the experience for a young naive Aussie coming coming to America, mainland America, for the first time. And uh, I was in the Outer Banks, and I got to see some some of the best boat builders in the country, and you know, learn the fishery over here, and went long lining with uh, Donny Braddock. So I went out catching swordfish and all kinds of crazy stuff with him. And from there, I um, I knew the Big Rock tournament was coming up in in Moorhead City, and a lot of the serious boats were fishing that tournament. It's a huge money tournament. They fished there before going across Bermuda. So I knew that was the best chance I had at meeting anybody to go across and fish the summer. So I ended up getting a job to be a gaff man for that tournament, go down there, fish that. We saw a fish that was probably big enough to win it, and it's a million-dollar prize prize money in that tournament. We had a 500-pound blue marlin come up and have a swipe at a lure but didn't, didn't eat it, never came back, and I think it was one with a 520 that year. So I... You know, got a little bit of a taste at you know fishing these tournaments in Australia. There's no money in the tournaments; it's a pickle dish at the end, and that's it. Pat on the back. And uh, here, it's like you know, wow, okay, this could change your life. You know, fishing these tournaments, especially for a crewman. You know, that's that's houses for you know, it's a down payment for a house, percentage of prize winning. And uh, second last day of the tournament, we're fueling up the boat, and there was captain walks over and talks to the, to Charles Haywood that I was with, and uh, 
he goes, oh, you wouldn't believe it. Our crewman just quit on us for the summer in Bermuda. You wouldn't happen to know of anybody wanting to go across. And my ears prick, hands in the air. <laughs> and uh, Charles Hayward goes, come meet Dingo. <laughs> so we got talking and I'd done a bunch of traveling at that point and a lot of lure fishing. And, and so that was that fishery in Bermuda was heavy tackle pulling lures. I'd spent a lot of time in Kona, Hawaii, learning from some of the best lure fishermen in the world. So we got talking and they're like, okay, well, it sounds like you, you know, know a bit about this. You know, when the tournament's done, come have a look at the boat. Tell us what you think. What do you think we need to do in pre preparation for, the for, for going over for the summer? And we'll start you on salary on Monday, but take the week off to yourself. Get your things ready because once we're gone, we're gone. I'm like, I went from hitchhiking and not a penny to my name to, oh, I'm on a salary now and getting ready to go across to Bermuda and fish these tournaments. And uh, it was quite a dream. And so we get over to, to Bermuda and, uh, you know, first tournament, we get a daily. We get like a $35,000 check in the first tournament. And I didn't know. It's, fish came up on the teaser and they had me registered as an angler just in case something happened and I caught a fish, you know, for IGFA rules. No one else can handle the gear or switch switch over or whatever. And fish came up on a squid chain. No one was in the cockpit, so I picked up the pitch bait and hooked this little 150-pound blue marlin and catch it. I didn't think too much of it until the prize giving and they call us up on the stage and giant big novelty size check and I look over the front and I'm like, oh, 35 grand for a 150 pound mile and I like this. I think you're used <laughs> to this. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the next tournament coming up was the biggest one. It was over, you know, the 4th of July, you know, time, but it was a Bermuda, um, Bermuda Billfish game, big game classic or something. It was a three-day tournament. First day of the tournament, we were out trolling on the other end of the island to where everyone else was. It was a family operation. So um, uh, Rob Rob was the son and he, he ran the boat and they're farmers from v Fredericksburg, Virginia. They, they're not seasoned fishermen. They love to fish, but they, they're not, a fish, they're not ex that very experienced. They've had some great success in tournaments. They've had some great people on board helping them compete in tournaments and caught big fish. And... Uh, you know, I was fortunate to be there, part of the team, and and you know, number one deckhand, and their full time guy that they have on board was was learnt, you know second deckhand for the season underneath me, even though I was new to their team, and uh, I set up the the spread how I'd been trained to fish in Hawaii, same drags and clip settings, hooks hook systems that Chip and Moles had taught me, and uh, you know, I told Bob, who was the father, I said, you know different scenarios that I'd experience with, you know, fish coming up and eating these lures and, and you know, how to use the drag to get good hook sets or if it's a fish is not hooked well, what to do. And, you know, if you get a fish eat and it's just peeling off drag real heavy but nobody sees it, you know, okay, well, that's probably a big fish. And, you know, it's not reacting to drag. Be prepared. You know, it could be a big one. So we've gone through all these scenario scenarios and talked about, you know, when the time comes, what we're going to do so we're prepared. We get a bite and nobody saw what it was on the, the long corner on this uh, black and purple leopard. It's a lure made by Big T in South Africa that became famous in Bermuda before this time. And that was the one lure that they said, you can put anything out in the spread that you like. That lure has to go on the long corner, you know, on the fourth wake or fifth wake. And, uh, but you can do whatever else. So sure enough, fish comes up and eats their lure. And I had all these beautiful beautiful custom handmade lures that I got shipped in for us for the trip or whatever, but it ate that lure. They, that was, that was the one that came and ate and, uh, probably had 15 pounds of drag, had a pretty light drag on the reel. And I said, Bob, come over, right, come up on the drag. He comes up to 20 pound. It's still crackling off. We're going ahead at eight knots. It's still crackling off. All right. 30 pounds comes up to 30 pounds. It's still crackling off. I'm like, Oh, it's a nice one. All right. Back the drag off, go to the chair. So he goes to the chair. Just as we're going into neutral, start clearing the gear and start coming back on this fish, a second marlin comes up in the spread. That's three, three, 350 pound fish. I'm like, Rob, go ahead, go ahead. Because now I've, under I've seen what can happen in these tournaments and, you know, how these fish can, you know, win you money. I'm like, every one of these counts towards our tally. You get release points, as big as fish dailies. There's all different ways you can end up with a check. So I'm... I'm thinking we need that fish as well, so get start going ahead. So we're clutched ahead, tro trolling again, and uh, you know fish eats a couple of times. We miss it, ends up coming tight. Mark the other deck end. He ended up fighting this fish stand up on a 130 chair rod, and uh, 
we've got Bob in the chair already with this big fish. We don't know how big it is. We, nobody's seen it. Started jumping out there and we're like, it's probably a qualifier. A qualifying fish is over 500 pounds. It looks to be bigger than that. And uh, Mark's got this other fish on. It jumps right over the top of the main line, nearly runs into the line, which could have broke it off and starts jumping up the other side of the boat. So Mark's fighting this stand up. And they're like, what do we do? What do we do? And uh, they wanted to go after the big fish first. And I said, no, I've had these situations happen in Australia. You catch the little one first, get rid of the little one. It's the easier one to handle. Then you deal with the big fish. So we do that. So we go chasing after the little one. And uh, big one smoked out a lot of line. And it started jumping out again. And we're like, oh, it might be a 700-pounder. It's a good fish. And we're getting low on line. There's maybe 100 yards of backing left. And Rob starts pivoting the boat to go after the big fish. I'm like, no, no, the little one's right here. We, we almost got it. Come on, Mark, you know, lift that thing up. And so he's like, all right, pivots it back and we go back after the little one. We get it up. We get a picture for the release and we, you know, get the hook out of the fish and let it go. And we get after the big one. And uh, we end up getting the fish and uh, on the leader. And uh, it was doing switchbacks from corner to corner. And I'm leadering this thing up, doing back wraps. And, and fish is working really hard. It's lit up blue. It's 40 minutes into the fight now, but this fish is still green. It's still, it's still got lots of fight in it. Get up close, Mark, the other deckhand, he gets a gaff in the shoulder of the fish. And we have another guy that's never seen a marlin on board. Get him to pick up a gaff. He puts one in it as well. We cleat the fish off, crack it between the eyes with a baseball bat, put out of its misery. And we go to slide it in the door. And I'm like, oh, man, this is, you know, three, four of us trying to pull in the door. We couldn't get it in. And uh, the angler, the father, he goes, why don't we back up and fill the cockpit with water and float them on in? I said, well, we could do that. But I heard someone do that down in... Bisbee's in Mexico and they clip the tail with a propeller and it's a disqualified fish. It doesn't count. So just bump the, you know, engines. Don't run over the fish and disqualify it. So we, one wave, another wave, we've got, you know, water up to our knees. Fish slides in, we clutch the boat ahead in gear and all the water drains out the, the door and, and the fish lays on the deck. And like, oh, that was smooth. That, it's like we'd done that before. <laughs> and uh, put a tape measure on the fish. And I didn't get to see the, um, you know, the numbers on it. And uh, I'm in Australia. I'm used to talking about these marlin in feet and inches. So we'd measure them the short measurement from the bottom jaw to the fork of the tail. And uh, so I'm like, all right, what, you know, what do you got? And he goes, ah, uh, you know, it's 138 inches. And I'm not used. I'm metric. I'm not used to talking mm -hmm. that way. We we would talk about feet and inches, but we wouldn't. Australians, most Australians, especially younger generation, had no idea, um, you know, what inches transferred mm -hmm. to you know off a you know when you're in a situation like this really quickly and so i asked him i said what's that in feet and inches and rob's like i think it's 10 foot eight i'm like oh that makes sense that's you know that's what I'm, i thought it'd be is you know it might be an 800 pound fish we do the girth and it's like six foot eight six foot eight i'm like wow that's a big girth for you know for that length but that makes sense you know C congratulation guys you know it's, we've got an 800 pound fish in the cockpit and we got the points for the other one well we go in that afternoon to weigh the fish like oh it's kind of growing as it's coming up out of the cockpit on the on the gantry i see the t tournament director's gone and i jump off and go look at the numbers and 1023 i'm like oh grander blue marlin in the in the in the atlantic and uh you know double header in the tournament so we ended up winning uh the biggest fish daily biggest fish overall and we caught a you know a couple more fish the next day and uh and a little one on the last day and so we got the most points, most, you know, got these daily prizes and ended up getting bit, pretty big checks at the end of the tournament and which, you know, changed my life. You know, I was able to go back to Australia and, and, you know, put a deposit down for a house and, you know. Wow. What did you guys win? Uh, you know, I think it all worked out to like probably 300000 or something. You know, there's bigger money tournaments. And I think even in Bermuda now it's probably much more. But at that point in time, that was a lot. Wow. So you've gone around the world, all these countries, part of 25,000 pound fish. What, what gets your juices going now? I mean, how do you downsize to snook, tarpon? Tarpon are great, obviously. They're big for fly guys around here, but they don't compare to a thousand pound fish. how do you readjust th this whole game of fishing in your head? Well, you know, the biggest adjustment was trying to recreate myself essentially because I spent my whole life pursuing giant fish and that was all my focus, even though I come from a background of, you know, inshore and offshore charter fishing and 
fresh and salt water and all kind of stuff and I love it all. Um, but settling down, having a family and now it's like, now what? Now what am I, what am I going to do? You know, I take salary jobs but I'm not fishing as hard and in the same destinations as I was before but salary is now more important than catching big fish. Big fish doesn't, doesn't keep the lights on. Mm-hmm. Before I didn't care about money. It wasn't about money. It was, it was about the pursuit of the fish. And, uh, you know, I love everything. It doesn't matter if it's dry flies in mountain streams. You know, I've told people before, if there's a ditch with water and I've got meat and string, I'll be trying to catch a crawdad. Just <laughs> trying to figure stuff out. It doesn't matter right. what it is. You know, I just like the all kinds of different angling challenges. And uh, the more difficult, the better for me. But, you know, as an Aussie, all Aussies dream one day to go to Florida and have a chance to go tarpon fishing. It doesn't matter if you fly or conventional just to have a chance to go and do it. So now here I am in Florida and I grew up catching barramundi and iconic Australian fish. And as I'm spending more time here, I'm learning, well, snook and barramundi are very, very similar similar to each other. Same techniques or very, you know, almost all the same techniques work. And um, I'm able to bring some techniques from Australia that people haven't seen here that I started dabbling with. I brought tackle with me and I'm trying these vibe lures and uh, all of a sudden I'm having success and uh, I'm like, oh, okay, there's potential where I can get away from traveling and uh, being away from my family and I can start my own inshore business. So I started doing research and we were living in Jupiter and uh, like it's just a small river system there. It's, you know, what, uh, you know, is it sustainable to be able to, to fish here year round? And uh figured, well, you know, spent a few years fishing for them. It seemed like it is. If if there's a natural event that messes up the water, I could easily tow my skiff elsewhere to go and fish. And within a three-hour radius, I figured out I could go to North Florida chasing big bull redfish. I can go to the Everglades chasing snook and tarpon, get down to Florida Bay or get down to the Keys. But my bread and butter would be Jupiter, and that's what I'd kind of figured out, and that was going to be my game plan. And, you know, I love it all. Right. I love all kinds of fishing. And and you're still chasing records a eight pound tarpon record right now you're chasing yeah so um one of my longtime friends and clients um ian kyneth um you know he was a groomsman in my wedding and uh we've been he started fishing with me um here once i set up my uh my business about six years ago um we talked about it we talked about record fishing he does it all with me fly bait cast a lure doesn't matter live baits lures fly into all of it whatever at the time seems to be the right thing to do or fun and he goes, all right, I think I'm ready to chase some records. I'm like, okay, let's let's do it. You know, which one makes the most sense right now? And we figured, well, the eight pound, you know, that that looks like you know, the one that makes the most sense. Let's 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 set our, you know, our what, goals on that particular. That's one twenty six, one twenty seven, one twenty seven five. There's Del Brown and, and Steve Huff. Yeah, so let's let's go and pursue that fish. We, we you, might not ever catch it, but that, that's the best uh, record, a tarpon record you can chase. That's the weakest. That's the weakest record. Yep. Yeah. Yep. And uh, but it's still a it's still a it's big still record. Big fish yeah. on, on I, I, on I saw you got a couple of gaffs in the back of your car. <laughs> I do. Yeah, got some gaffs in my car. Um, so, you know, we set up set off to do that. And in in uh, you know, first two fish that ate, he broke off on the on the bite. But after that, he figured out you yeah. know yeah you know go easier on them. And uh, I think he ended up uh, we got twenty fish out of sixty seven this year on eight pound. Um, up to 120 pounds. We had the gaffs out on a couple that were bigger than that. So even though we got the leader in the rod and You're close. we got really close to them, we're not counting those fish to our numbers. They were, right. you know, one that was probably very similar to the record and one that was well over that. Both fish we got very, very close to. Um, one, we didn't have a gaff, man, on one of those fish. It would have been me most likely going swimming if I was fortunate enough to get tight to it. And then on another trip, we had a gaff, man, um, with us because you know we really quickly realized that you know you've got to have got to have an extra person for for yeah. doing it yeah uh, but you know 20 fish on eight pound in one year is for, that's pretty good it's a great year yeah, it's, it's very a good. big learning curve yeah well dingo thank you so much yeah thank what, you what an incredible life of fishing you've had yeah thank you yeah, yeah. we could go on for hours <laughs> might yeah. need to have you come back yeah yeah, buddy. This, yeah we've got more stories for sure it's been been a heck of an adventure and you know, I'm looking forward to hopefully many more. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. I really appreciate it. And I, I love seeing you wherever I see you because I know you got a great new story to tell. <laughs> I love love seeing you guys. It's, yeah. uh, you know, 
like-minded people and just sharing these adventures and hopefully we get to have some adventures together yeah yeah but you know before we leave uh i just want to make mention that you know dean butler one of the greatest fly guides on the planet fly fisherman too an innovator a pioneer you know finding you know those flats in in australia he was inducted in the hall of fame you know this september and it was great seeing you and your and your buddy you know drinking till three hours in the morning like a proper aussie celebration yeah, so. it's a good thing we had to get up and get on planes the next morning because it could have gone on a lot longer <laughs> it's so great sharing that moment with you guys so again thank you so much nico yeah thank yeah. you thanks jared appreciate it buddy yeah, yeah. pleasure what appreciate it thank you very much for having me here you got it what a so it's just a